with Lou on Community TV of Santa Cruz. I'm Lou Tuosto, and I'm your uh, speaker this night tonight, and I'm going to uh, get, uh, have guests that I'm going to interview uh, on our show this evening. And I'm always excited about doing a show, but especially with uh, some of the guests that we have tonight. Uh, they are some of the most informant people. Uh, they know about what's going on in the community, and they are elected. Uh, and uh, as usual, this show is about you and how you might be able to enhance your, uh, your, your place uh, of living in, in the Santa Cruz uh, Monterey area. And this show will be going into Monterey actually as well. So uh, we're excited to talk to people that have jurisdiction in both counties. Uh, this evening, we're talking with uh, three people, three of my favorite uh, guests uh, that have been on the show before. Our number one person uh, that we're having next to me uh, talk is John Leopold, and he was first elected to the Sony Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors in 2008, uh, representing the 1st District, which includes Live Oak, Soquel, and the Summit area, and John previously served on the Cabrillo College Governing Board, and welcome, and thank you for being here, John. Happy to be here. We've got some exciting things to talk about, and he will be our, uh, most likely, uh, we'll kind of go to this, he'll be our county representative to talk about those county issues, uh, although he is in, uh, again, District uh, uh, 1. Uh, our second guest uh, is somebody that uh, everybody knows who they are, uh, been around for a lot of years, uh, and he served as the California Secretary of Natural Resources for Governor Jerry Brown uh, from January 2011 to 2019. He also served as, as a member of the State Integrated Waste Management. Uh, he also sit, uh, was on the State Assembly and State, uh, as well as serving on uh, Cabrillo College uh, Board as well, uh, and he is currently running for the 17th Senate, uh, Senate District, and, and that's, of course, our own John Laird, so. Great to be here, Lou. Thank you for being here, John. And uh, our third guest is uh, our uh, U.S. Uh, Congressional District Representative uh, of the Central Coast of California, which encompasses Monterey, San Benito County, and portions of Santa Cruz and Santa Clara County. Uh, and this representative, uh, uh, Jimmy Panetta, has uh, represented us for several terms already. He is currently serving on the House uh, Committee on the Ways and Means, uh, the House of Committee on, in Agriculture, as well as the House Committee in Budget. And Jimmy fought, I understand, uh, to really work hard to be on all three of these because the House and Ways Committee is all time consuming. Uh, and I think the Budget Committee, as well as the Ag Committee, certainly represents our district uh, in our area. And so thank you for all that hard work, Jimmy. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with these two esteemed uh, public servants. Thank you. Let me share the stage with them. Very good. We will talk about some stuff tonight that I think is exciting in that, um, again, uh, it's a little bit of a different format. Traditionally, we do one person goes for a while and then the next person goes. This is going to be kind of an overlap. And so uh, what I've done is I very uh, strategically uh, chose several um, topics that uh, all three of you can kind of chime in on at the, at the national level, uh, at the county level, at the state level. Uh, and give us uh, input. And, and uh, although John Laird is not currently, he is running and uh, very confident that he will win that spot. And so he will most likely be our representative there. Uh, but he brings a great amount of experience. And one of the, the hottest uh, uh, items right now, and it's in the newspaper, uh, it's everywhere, uh, is housing. Let's talk a little bit about housing. Um, in our area, in particular California, but especially uh, in Santa Cruz, I'm always amazed at how young people can even buy houses here. Uh, it, you know, the, you have to be making some pretty good money to be able to do that. But uh, what, um, let's start out with uh, with you, Jimmy, if we could. Uh, what uh, are you doing and what's coming down the pipe, uh, uh, so to speak, that might help those that are trying to find housing they can afford? Look, I, I appreciate that, Lou. And I think, you know, all three of us, uh, including your, all four of us, including you, understand that affordable housing is is a huge issue here not just in santa cruz where the average housing price is nine hundred dollars rent is 1700 i think the average rent uh, rental price um, this is an issue that affects all of us on the central coast it affects all of california it's exactly why you heard uh, governor newsom in his state of the state 
basically make it his number one issue, housing and homelessness. Uh, it is something that affects all of us. But what you're seeing is a lot of localities sort of just kind of throw up their hands, unfortunately. And I believe this is an issue, and I'm sure John and John will agree with me, that this is one that needs to be all hands on deck. And so we need to do it to address this at every level. Now, I just came from Hollister, San Benito County, where for the grand opening of a, a senior center, a senior housing complex called Sunrise Senior Housing Complex, and that was an example of what I believe the Central Coast stands for and how it's addressing our affordable housing issue in the sense that this was a project that had all layers of government to make it happen. The federal level, it dealt with tax credits. They used low-income housing tax credits to build it. Uh, the state and local level were there, making sure the grants were there to provide their funding. Uh, and so it's, it's that type of project, that type of effort that needs to happen. At the federal level, what I can do, and I'll let John and John talk about their efforts at the state and county level, but at the federal level, what we can do is make sure that there are grants that come in, number one. And we've continued to do that. Home, HUD bash, continuum of care, uh, heat, uh, heap, and other, other types of grants like that. Um, we've actually, in the three years that I've been in office, we've been able to bring in 40 million of grants to housing and homeless programs. With this administration, who've constantly wanted to cut back these programs, we fought pretty hard to keep them, and not only kept them, we've had them allocated to this region. Second area we can focus on are tax credits. 4% tax credits for, re for re re rehabilitation, and the 9% tax credits for construction. Last term, we upped the 9% tax credits by 12%. I have a bill called the Affordable Housing Tax Credit uh, that ups the 9% tax credits for uh, developers to use by 50%. Can we talk about a tax credit uh, for those of our, our listeners that aren't familiar with what that means? Is that from the developer's perspective or from the buyer or both? How does that work? Mainly the developer. So the developer okay. will get those uh, from the state or from the county uh, in order to then uh, use those to invest and then uh, build the, the project. Okay. As long as there's affordable housing component attached to it. Okay. What the affordi affordable housing component? What does that come from? The local level? Does it come from the state? Does it come from the county? Where, where does that initiate initially start out? <laughs> well, each project uh, will attempt to have some affordability based on money that's available or laws that require a part of it. I mean, there's a state law that gives you uh, density bonuses, allows you to build more units uh, and increase the density if you guarantee that a certain percentage of those units are affordable. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is uh, we're lucky to have somebody that's advocating that way at the federal level. And the thing about it is, is I'm old at this point. And so I was on the city council here before mm -hmm. and uh, after the earthquake. And the federal government uh, was much more uh, in the business then. If you go to Santa Cruz right by the jail, there's the Blaine Street Apartments. It focuses on people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. There were major projects like that that the federal government would be in and Ronald Reagan stepped back. And that's why it's great that we're maximizing what we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, at the state level, the debate is a, across a number of different things. We theoretically have a more than three million housing deficit, three million units to be able to feel like you're meeting the need. And yet, where does that go? Mm -hmm. The most we've built in the state in one year, in recent years, has been 250,000. So if we have a three million deficit, even if we're building at the highest level that we have built in recent years, it would still take a decade and a half or so uh, to get there. And so uh, at the state legislative level, they've put rent caps on and they're uh, at a high level compared to some of the proposals of rent control, but the idea is, is if you honestly believe that the free market will lower prices over time, it's not going to lower it for, for quite a while, and so you have caps to guarantee that, that the most egregious uh, uh, rent increases aren't done. And when I was in the legislature the first time around, uh, we, Governor Schwarzenegger at the time wanted to do infrastructure bonds, and so he had bonds for schools and for roads and for flood control. And uh, the speaker and I as budget chair said, we're not approving your package unless there's an affordable housing bond. And they didn't want it. 
Uh, Wait, for, let's back up for a second. So you were the chair when you were on the I was assembly? I chair of the budget committee for most of my run when I was in the state assembly. Okay. And, and so in negotiating that, okay. we leveraged in an affordable housing bond. Mm -hmm. It ended up providing enough money for about 50,000 affordable housing units to be constructed. In the area, I know Chispa mm -hmm. utilized that money in the Salinas area mm -hmm. uh, uh, to do it. And yet, go back to the numbers I originally mentioned, 50,000 would only be one-fifth of one year if we were at the highest year, and we have a three a million deficit. And the real problem is, is across the state, a lot of the local government jurisdictions are not having trouble with market rate housing. They're having trouble meeting their goals for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so there's- Could you talk about the differences there, the, the terminology? Between, uh, you talk about affordable housing. Well, market rate, market rate is, uh, uh, Jimmy says it's a, a, an average of $900,000 uh, for a house in Santa Cruz County. Mm -hmm. uh, that is closer to market rate. Okay. And you're ho hoping that an affordability level will be for somebody that has an income level substantially below mm -hmm. and is able to get into housing okay. as a result without getting into numbers. And, sure. and, and, and at the state level, there's all these debates going on. It's really fractious because Scott Weiner from San Francisco has this bill, and he has been brilliant in defining what the problem is, and everybody agrees on the problem, and then saying, but this is the solution, and not everybody agrees on the solution. But it's been defined in a way that you somehow are not addressing affordable housing if you don't agree with his solution. And I think his bill basically says, well, override local zoning and allow for increased densities because our real deficit is in apartments. And he's right, but he wants to uh, uh, benefit if you're near transit, and that is really in more urban areas. So the bill's been amended to only apply to counties that are 600,000 population or more, which takes out a lot of the central coast. But uh, he wants to, to streamline, and it, uh, it, it still couldn't pass the legislature, right. and it was mostly people from Los Angeles that mm -hmm. voted against it yeah. that kept it from passing rather than, than Northern California. And Scott's a good friend of mine. He's endorsed me, but he believes in political blunt force trauma. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what he has well, been doing with you this You want to talk bill. about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just was with him in the last day and talked to him about it because I think there are people that are enthusiastic and, and what you really have to do on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, one of the things when I was on the city council, and particularly right after the earthquake, mm -hmm. when we were rebuilding the downtown yeah. and we had a chance to provide affordable housing, yeah. if you look at the St. George, which is above Bookshop Santa Cruz, yeah. the developer came to us and said, uh, I, I want to do 25% affordable in the rebuild, and it wouldn't pencil out otherwise, and we held him until he agreed to something like 45% affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But at the time, there were more funding sources, some of the federal and other, that allowed him to utilize those to guarantee the 45. And if you're like John in the, in the local office, it's on a case-by-case -case basis with a developer. They'll always say it won't pencil out if you make us do more than the minimum amount of affordable housing, mm -hmm. and it's up to the local elected officials to basically say, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can do more. And because we did that with the St. George, there's hundreds of people that have had affordable housing over the last 30 years mm -hmm. that might not have been able to live in the region because we did that, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, and one of the ways uh, here in Santa Cruz County that we're trying to tackle the problem is we're trying to use our land to build affordable housing. We know that that is one of the, the, the most cost, uh, uh, one of the areas where it costs the most is the land. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had some properties that we had to sell as part of the redevelopment agency closure, uh, and we just approved a project after extensive community discussion um, to build 57 units of family affordable housing for uh, a very low low income, mm -hmm. uh, along with a health center and a, and a dental center. Uh, and we uh, have dedicated two pieces of land that were designated for parks, that we didn't have the money to build the parks, and we gave them to Habitat for Humanity to build another 18 houses. Uh, so we have another property at 7th and Bromer um, that uh, it was zoned for visitor accommodation. It's in the coastal zone, but mm -hmm. we've been working with the Coastal Commission, who understands the housing um, needs that we have, to do part of it uh, for a small hotel, but part of it for up to 48 units of housing. Um, 
um, maybe 20% uh, of them will be uh, affordable. So we're trying to think differently uh, about uh, development by using our land. We've also started back in 2012 a process um, to really think differently about uh, the kind of development, sort of ahead of the state, really, and uh, to, to look about increasing dense residential densities on our transit corridors. And mm -hmm. we held extensive number of community meetings because part of it was public education. We've mm -hmm. had four decades uh, of single family home development mm -hmm. where you have a single family home on a 6,000 square foot lot. Um, and when the, the voters here in Santa Cruz approved Measure J, which said we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna create an urban services line, we're gonna focus development in that urban core of Live Oak, Soquel, and Aptos, and we're not gonna provide services and keep it rural for the rest of the county, there were 13,000 undeveloped residential parcels. Wow. Well, today wow. there's less than 2,400. Yeah. So we're not gonna run out tomorrow, but we really yeah. knew that we needed to start looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. So we had these discussions, we got buy-in from the community, um, and it, it's one of the tensions that we feel with the state, uh, not because we totally support what they're trying to do around uh, housing, uh, but we're making great advances here, mm -hmm. and and that we think that we're meeting the uh, we're, we're we're actively working to develop a different stock of housing that will meet the needs here in uh, Santa Cruz, and we don't like it when the state tells us what to do, uh, and that's why I'm looking forward to working with John because he understands as, as someone from local government. Uh, there's obviously also a huge role for the, the federal government to play, um, as Jimmy has talked about, providing resources and having an, uh, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development that understands that there has to be resources to build um, affordable housing. It's really critical uh, because those 57 units that I just talked about, you know, it's, it's like an Indiana Jones moment where you have, to, you have to get all over these hurdles and avoid all these traps in order to get that housing built. Um, and if we had a little bit more resources, we could do a lot more of that here in Santa Cruz County. And it, it, there's a lot of nuance into what each of us is saying because, yeah. you, you know, with the Wiener Bill, uh, it would uh, uh, really try to facilitate housing, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's affordable. And exactly. it's like my beef is, is that if you're going to do that bill and go to all the trouble, you need to guarantee that a certain amount is affordable. And then when you do certain bills that... Uh, sort of passed down to the locals. It's there's this one situation in Santa Cruz where I took a lot of heat at a housing forum mm -hmm. because it would streamline the process mm -hmm. if you did a certain percentage of affordable housing, and then it turned out Santa Cruz County already did that percentage, so it streamlined the procedure without any gain in affordable housing. And I had the audacity to suggest that the local should decide whether it's additive to the amount of affordable housing. And it caused some developers to go completely nuts. And I think it just goes back to my analogy about the St. George. You do what you can do on a project basis because your job is not to uh, uh, be a tool. Your job is to make sure that on a case-by-case -case basis, as much affordable housing is built as allows a project to pencil out and, sure. and works. And that's, and that's, if I may, Lou, I mean, yeah. and that's, that's a good point. I mean, we're, we're pretty lucky to have, a, you know, a supervisor and soon-to-be senator here. Um, but the fact is, is that, and, and be so progressive in the way they look at housing. You got to realize, though, that there is this thing that we've all heard of called nimbyism. And we're dealing with that in other parts of my district in which we can give them all the, the grants and all the programs and we can give them all the tax credits to build. But if they're local entities that don't want that uh, type of project or any project or any housing in their area, uh, then it kind of gets stunted. And it doesn't happen. And I was at a meeting earlier today in Gonzales in which uh, we, were, we were meeting with Monterey County and the Board of Supervisors. And there were uh, both the State Senator Monning was there and State Senator uh, Caballero uh, were both there. And they both words out of the mouth was, we, you know, we have to stop NIMBYism. Can't let that happen. Wow. Well, and, I, and, it, and it takes some work at the local level. That, and this is where I think communities that are moving forward and getting this stuff done uh, shouldn't be forced to do uh, to do things that that run counter to that social contract that we have with the community when we engage in these uh, uh, conversations. Uh, so when we did that 57 units of affordable housing, we didn't just notice people within 300 feet, we didn't notice people uh, 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 over a thousand feet away. Because you know that the people who live right next door are gonna have great concerns. 
But the people who live six blocks away, they knew that they needed that housing. They knew yeah. that, they, that they wanted that health center. They knew <laughs> that they were going to use that dental clinic. And we would have meetings where we had 125 people. Yeah. And there was a lot of support for the project. Instead of the, the 20 people who would be living in the houses right around it saying, well, I don't like this uh, because it's going to ruin my view or it's, I'm going to have noise or um, you know, I won't be able to, to run with uh, you know, my dog. So uh, it's helpful when you get the whole community involved in this conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. And when the communities that are doing like we are doing that here in Santa Cruz, uh, we can get a lot done. And, we, and we've shown that we can get a lot done. And he, 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 apropos of that and, and what Jimmy just said, in the Senate district where I'm running, there's 21 cities. And <laughs> I have the endorsement of uh, all but two of the mayors. And I finally, in the last month, met with the last two, even though they're not endorsing me. And they're all upset about Sacramento telling them uh, that what they have to do. And I said, well, you know, the best argument against it is to build affordable housing. Here, here. If you meet your local goals, then your argument is really strengthened. Mm -hmm. If you're not meeting any goals in affordable housing, and then you're arguing, we don't want you to get it in our grill, mm. that's not a very credible argument. There's something really neat going on here. I, I just love it. Uh, you guys are integrating it at the local level, at the county level, at the national level, at the state level, and you bring so much into the mix. And I think a lot of our listeners, including me, uh, don't, don't really know how all that stuff works together. And we're hearing it firsthand. That's exciting. You know, to know why, you know, somebody goes, well, we shouldn't, that's, no, 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 that doesn't work or whatever. But then you have to look at what happens, you know, with over, overlying rules and regulations that apply. And you have to do the, all the stuff. You have to do the compliance with everybody. And that's what's happening. some good Well, it's really hard. Yeah. And it's like if I have a regret yeah. uh, on my city council years, which are 30 years ago, this November, <laughs> coming November I left, is that we didn't provide for higher densities right next to the university. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it would have been a transit issue. It would have been a low, and, and we did what we thought were high densities and, and all the neighbors were mad at us for doing even the higher ones we did. But that was probably uh, something that looking back, uh, all the uh, graduate student strikers could walk directly to the picket line. They wouldn't have to take a, a, <laughs> well, a well, transit. You, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the unincorporated parts of the county, three-story buildings for some people are considered to be tall buildings. Yeah. Um, but then when we had that community conversation, we talked about four-story buildings in certain places. And yeah. that's the big change, because if you look in the mid-county, there aren't even a lot of three-story buildings. So if we can get three-story buildings lining our transit corridors, we're going to provide hundreds of units of, of new housing, um, and that'll be in incredibly helpful for us. Mm -hmm. And then there are some places where we think there's enough land to go even taller than that, and I'm sure we're going to see housing like that. Yeah. Well. And, and one, just one more thing. I mean, it, this is, like I said, this is an issue that normally was a state and local issue. Uh, you're getting a lot of discussions in Capitol, on Capitol Hill right now about this, so much so that you were saying uh, the latest piece of legislation is called the Rent Relief Act, mm -hmm. where if you're a renter and you pay over one third of your income towards rent and utilities, mm -hmm. then there you, there's a formula that, that you'll get a federal tax break for that. So it's the, these types of outside of the box you know, ideas that are actually coming out of Capitol Hill on an issue, which has traditionally been a local issue, but realizing that it takes all levels to address it. Sure. A good discussion. Uh, this is, I, I, even, I, I kind of even hate to, uh, to go off into a different uh, uh, topic because this is going so well. Uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is amazing. So thank you, gentlemen, for all those good things that you're, you're bringing to uh, the table to talk about housing. We do have, we do have a couple of other things. And, and one of the, I went to a debate last night. It was about climate and environment. Um, and it, 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 was, uh, it, it was pretty charged. Um, we're going to talk about uh, climate and environment, and certainly it's not just a national uh, thing. It's a statewide thing, and, and certainly how it comes down, trickles down to the, uh, to the local level with what county supervisors do. Um, let's talk about, and I guess we'll start out with uh, Jimmy if we could. Um, the, the county certainly has taken the leadership uh, role in reducing emissions in our region. Um, and on the national level, can you give us some kind of perspective on what's happening there with sure. bills and perspective and from, from D.C.? From yeah. There? Look, I, I don't think you're going to get any disagreement from the three of us about what's cause, causing the effects in climate, I think. Uh, not just us, but leading scientists say it's about the release of CO2 into the air. And the best way to stop the temperature from rising would be to 
cap that somehow and, and to prevent that. And the best way that leading economists say is to put a fee on the uh, amount of carbon that's being released. And so that you, what you're seeing this year, especially 2020, are a number of pieces of legislation uh, that are coming out with the sort of uh, a fee on carbon. Now, I introduced the Climate Action Rebate Plan, uh, along with Dianne Feinstein and Senator Chris Coons and their uh, sister bill in the Senate. And this bill puts a fee on carbon output. It's put $15 per metric ton of carbon output. But then what we're also doing with that dividend is reinvesting it. Reinvesting it, 70% goes into the families that are going to be affected by such a fee and climate change the most, and that's low and middle income families. We give them a monthly dividend. And then at the same time, we take the 30, 30% of that dividend and put it into research and development highway trust fund to make sure that there's clean, resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then we also uh, deal with technical training for technical <coughs> job training for those workers who are in the fossil fuel ind industry and need to uh, learn how to transition into green jobs. And so it's these types of pieces of legislation that you're seeing more and more of now. Yeah. We just got to make sure that we actually stop talking about it, actually do something about it. Okay. So we've introduced these bill, these, these types of bills. Now it's time to actually do something about it. But look, I admit, um, Ever since I've been in office, I've been dealing with this administration since January of 2017. This is an administration that has constantly tried to infringe and roll back uh, the protections that we put in place. I mean, sure. we know, that, thanks to uh, people before me, mm -hmm. that there have been some stalwart champions when it comes to the environment. I'm sitting next to two of them who have made sure that protections are in place, especially around here, especially something we value as much as the environment. And when I think of that, I think of my old wrestling coach who told me, he said, look, Jimmy, once you make your mark in the world, watch out for those with the erasers. And what we have in the White House is a, an, an administration who has big erasers or big Sharpies, whatever you want to call it, that are constantly trying to roll back marks on the protections that we put in place. And it's our job to make sure that one, we you know, have hearings, two, we ask questions, three, we introduce legislation, which we've been doing for the past three years. But ultimately, in order to make sure that there's movement on the environment, movement on the types of the types of legislation that I talked about that puts a fee on carbon, is voting them out of office in November. That's what it's going to come down to. We have to make sure that we uh, people hold this administration accountable for the lack of action and 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 the inaction, not just inaction, but the negative action that they've taken on the environment. And to just pick up from that. Um, you know the the tough thing is 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 uh, uh, when there's that kind of lack of leadership at the national level, and so it, it, I've been involved. You know, in the 17 years I've sort of been involved with the state in trying to step in. Mm -hmm. So when uh, George W. Bush uh, joined with Korea and Iran to be the only ones not to sign the Kyoto Protocols. Um, Basically, we decided at the state level, well, we're going to adopt the Kyoto Protocols at the state level and enshrine them into law. So 2006, AB 32 was adopted, and it said exactly what all the other countries had agreed to for their entire country. We'll go back to the emissions level in 1990, uh, uh, that we had in 1990 by the time we reach 2020, and that'll be a 12 to 15 percent reduction in uh, emissions. We're 2020. We have met that goal. Uh, uh, we had an additional goal that Governor Brown signed in 2011 to, by 2020, have 33% of our electricity be from renewable energy. We have met that goal. Mm -hmm. In the first Jerry Brown administration, um, we had very efficient building. We still have a goal of doubling the efficiency level, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that California's electricity consumption has risen slightly in the last 40 years as opposed to the other state is some of that work that was done in the 70s and 80s, and we have to redouble it. And we have done it on oceans. The thing about it is, is that now we have to use this November to make sure we get the national government back in the play. And I was in a forum uh, earlier this week from when we're taping this, and one of my opponents just says, well, um, there have just been lots of plans. They go up in the wall. We just don't need plans. And it was like, no, we've actually been doing it. <laughs> we have been doing it. And, the, and, the, and now the next goals are going to be much harder. We have taken right. the easy part. We, we have to switch 5,000 
gas cars out of existence mm -hmm. in the next mm -hmm. few years. Mm -hmm. And as Jimmy said, it puts the challenge, the people that can least afford to do it yeah. are, you know, disadvantaged. And how do we make sure there's equity in how we respond to climate and it's ju just not some wealthy person that can afford a Tesla. It's some, and then somebody's hanging by a thread month to month and has a gas guzzler and somehow we're penalizing them when they're economically hanging by a thread. And how do you do funding sources as he just described in the bill uh, uh, to allow them to be able to transition in what we really have to do, but in a way that doesn't economically penalize them. You know, and, so and good, he, good, wait a minute, good depth on that. And, and I, I would have to say, uh, you know, being uh, and serving in the California Secretary for the National Resources, you bring a lot to the table. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. It's good stuff. But I want to also talk about something you did for Community TV. Uh, and I think you can give me more detail. I, I served on the board here, and Community TV is a wonderful outreach. And we'll come back to you. Yeah, on. sure. Um, but if you could tell me a little bit about that, we've got one of the nicest studios, uh, and I've been to several studios. Uh, in different counties. This is a beautiful one, uh, and we put it out to the public as well for, uh, for usage, and uh, that's why we're doing the taping here. It's just gorgeous, but it's really high end. Talk a little bit about what you did. You know, it's funny because in these forums, there's somebody that always says, oh, you don't have to know much. You just hire staffs and they do it. Oh, uh, you know, uh, and this is an example uh, because when I was on the city council, Joining together with the county, the yeah. city and the county together yeah. tried to award a franchise yeah. for our local cable TV. Mm -hmm. And the feds had, at the time, it was the Reagan years, and they had tried to take away the rights of communities to do this. And in the end, we did a court settlement. And the court settlement the city and county did said that because 93% of the people in Santa Cruz County were hostages to broadcast, we had to have cable. We couldn't get much without cable, that we negotiated basic rate protections. If you had basic uh, cable, you could not get uh, dramatic increases. And also, it's very rural, and people were not getting cable in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so we got 100 miles of line extensions of cable into the areas, and we got three community access television stations. Mm -hmm. So then you fast forward to the fact that there's a bill that was not liked by cities and counties when I was in the legislature that would grant state franchises to anyone. There would no longer be these distinct regional franchises. The state could just say, AT&T, you can do cable for entire California. And I negotiated this thing with the speaker. I basically said to him, I am not supporting your bill unless you take care of Santa Cruz County. So very quietly, 10 days before the end of session, <laughs> an amendment was slipped into the bill. It's a wrestling move, right, Jimmy? <laughs> it works. Yeah, How it was slipped into the bill. Right. It's good. And it's good. Santa Cruz County was exempted from the provisions of that bill for, the, yeah. for another eight or nine years. It was for the life of that consent decree yeah. agreement. And it was one of those things that uh, I wanted to do it for Monterey, but I did not have the legal justification. Mm -hmm. And Monterey wasn't happy that that they didn't get it. So in a rare moment for an elected official, I did not claim immediate credit. <laughs> and I let the local community TV advocates thank me in public for doing it. And I remember uh, Pat Bush, who was the cable guy at the county at the time, emailed me and said, we haven't seen this at the state level since Henry Mello. Good work. You just like uh, did this. And, and it's, you know, and, and it's John's constituents evoke. near the summit and in the area that really benefit from this. And it, it, deep down, that's, that's why we all run, is to do things like this. And, but but yeah, you got but, some really good stuff accomplished. Sorry, I, can, I, I <coughs> have to camp out just for one more second here. You got some things accomplished. You, you're going upstream on that, and you got it done. It, that's impressive. That, to me, uh, is the way that a politician is supposed to do stuff. Uh, you were strong, uh, and I'm sure you, you had some pushback, but you got the job done. And, and, and today, uh, you know, we're enjoying the kinds of things that we enjoy here uh, at Community TV that a lot of other communities just don't have. They just don't There's have still one local representative for the League of Cities that begrudges it to me because I should have opposed the entire bill uh. and, and not done it, and yet. The bill passed 76 to nothing. So uh, what, it would have been 76 to nothing. It would have been 75 to one, and Santa Cruz wouldn't have been protected. So uh, I, I did what I thought. Go ahead. Right well, thing. so the, so the benefit <laughs> of the, the cool. local benefit uh, uh, beyond just having 25 percent 
uh, uh, cheaper cable service than any of the surrounding communities for those eight years that, that John wrote into that bill. Yeah. Um, it also allowed us to keep the, those protections and requirements of the local cable company to provide access in the rural areas. So I have constituents up in the summit area. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first got elected, I thought, oh, well, these are mountain people. You know, they're, they're living off the grid. But it turns out it's all high tech people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where they live and they go down in the valley uh, for their jobs. Yeah, and they couldn't get internet. They were using satellite services and other things. And they came to me and they said, uh, Supervisor Leopold, we need your help. Uh, uh, we want to get um, access to the internet. And uh, because of these provisions that John had written into this uh, bill in 2006, in 2014, we were able to negotiate with the cable company that they had to require, they, they were required uh, to provide service to uh, approximately 600 uh, homes. Well, uh, they, they still had to come up with some money. The community raised about $150,000. And because we put on a rural access fee on everyone's bill, we were able to get the last $100,000 from the cable company to complete the work. Mm -hmm. And now uh, those six or 700 homes in the Summit area, North Rodeo Gulch area, have access to the internet. Their houses are worth more money mm -hmm. because they have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all, they're all connected in a different way. And they have a 95033 uh, talk, and they have a mountain alliance that are connected through the internet mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a new way for that community to be connected. Um, and you see more people attending events because they know what's going on. They, sure. They're connecting with their neighbors. So uh, I was glad uh, 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 last year to take John up to um, the summit area, and he had a, a, a room full of folks that he could tell the story to, and they, they were on the edge of their seat the whole time because uh, they could see the benefit in, sure. in their community. Sure. So but when are, state and local work together, you can do a lot. Yeah, but are there insurance companies insuring them up there for a while? Well, <laughs> that's, that's the that's, next that's, that's issue. Yeah, issue. And, exactly. and actually, exactly. Uh, 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 and that yeah. gets us back to climate. Yeah. Uh, wildland fire and sea level sure. rise are the two big issues sure. that regardless of what we, we were overwhelmingly successful in emissions reduction across yeah. the globe. That's still going to happen to some level, and sea level rise and wildland fire in our coastal area, and now insurance is being canceled in Big Sur, a little bit in Carmel Valley, oh, yeah. Santa Cruz yeah, Mountains, Mountains northern exactly. uh, San Luis Obispo County, yeah. and that's going to be a big yeah. issue. We had a, we had a roundtable last night where Insurance Commissioner Laura came down, and uh, Bill, uh, uh, Senator Monning, and Supervisor Adams, and a, a few of the local stakeholders. Um, and, you know, I think Laura, uh, Commissioner Laura has been doing, I think he's done 20 of these, where he goes around the different counties because yeah, it's not sure. just Central Coast. It's throughout California that these insurance companies are just pulling stakes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. literally sending these notices in the mail saying, sorry, uh, we're canceling your insurance within 45 days. And there's, it's if, you, if you talk to the insurance companies, there's this whole secondary market thing right. and people are right. no longer investing in California. But California State has this program that is called the FAIR program, which has become pejorative to anybody that is on it because yeah. when, which is the fallback thing. If all else is canceled, you can get insurance, basic insurance through the California FAIR program, but the law says has to pay for itself. So the rates are maybe in some cases three and four times higher wow. than the insurance <laughs> policy that was just canceled yeah. for people yeah. and it, it, it just causing screams and so, this is a big, uh, uh, there's all these moving pieces, right. and yet we can't, uh, the, the retired fire chief in Big Sur uh, had me call an insurance agent in Carmel Valley to have me explained exactly why it was being canceled. The insurance agent was, was really good. He says, yeah, there's a secondary thing. Yes, I want to insure, but the underlying thing is, is what's the fire protection in the area? Yeah. And if the fire protection in the area is reasonable and there's road access, yeah. in some places in Big Sur, there's not road access. Yeah. That, that's very good. And therefore, that's the insurance issue. And then people, it, it, there's only 1,500 people that live for 70 miles in Big Sur. And so them passing a fire tax yeah. is a pretty dramatic thing. And so <clears throat> much less roads. And so there's all these other issues of fire protection, road access, 
uh, the individual situation of each location and whether there's protected space and other things. And, and then, you know, falling back on Lloyd's of London or the FAIR program, and that's not really where we want our constituents to be. But a lot of these insurance companies aren't telling them what it is they're looking at exactly. So there's no transparency and there's no standard qualification as to what exactly qualifies for them, unfortunately. Yeah, here in Santa Cruz, we're just going to be hiring our first climate action manager, or really a resiliency officer, mm -hmm. to help us deal with adaptation plans. So I know in, in my district, we're doing a shaded fuel break around the Loma Prieta School to offer temporary refuge if, if God forbid, there's a fire um, and, they, and they can't get off the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to be working with CAL FIRE and state funds uh, to be able to do shaded fuel breaks um, along all the major evacuation routes. Mm -hmm. And the state, I think, is going to be putting a resiliency bond on the uh, November ballot, uh, uh, something close to $5 billion. That, uh, that we want to be prepared to be able to access some of that money because not only do we have to deal with fire, but we also have to deal with sea level rise. And uh, we're, at the board, we're, we're, we're going to be dealing with March 10th, a new policy around where we're going to let you or not let you build seawalls to protect your homes and uh, uh, where if, the, if waves knock out your house, whether you will or won't be able to rebuild. But we also have to prepare for the infrastructure. So East Cliff Drive or Rio Del Mar are, are very vulnerable to sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And is there things that we need to do to, um, to allow those areas to still be used? But on East Cliff Drive, I'm more familiar with. But, you know, there's three bodies of water that, that uh, mm -hmm. if the sea level rise, it's, you're going to have one body of water. And so do we need to start thinking about bridges? Is what's our plan there? And then how we get the money mm -hmm. to exactly. be able to pay for exactly. $10 million and bridges? And I was just exactly. for eight years the point person for <laughs> adaptation and resiliency. That resided in my agency. I was the person that had to do it statewide. And a lot of this is based in science at the root mm -hmm. so that on sea level rise, we actually did two comprehensive studies on what was going to happen in California 2050, 2100. And it kind of crazy making because you have to get the scientists to talk in English and you have to get them to talk in, in more than these random probabilities. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the funnier moments of the eight years is the scientists are going to brief the governor on the latest one, and it's maybe a year before we were done. And he was really late, so I'm sitting there in his office with the scientists talking to them before he gets there. And I discovered that all their work was in millimeters and centimeters. And I'm like, we're a feet and inches state. Nobody will understand this. And they're frantically doing uh, uh, calculations before he walks in the room. And the other thing was, is he got right to it. And he, in the Jerry Brown way, says, you don't really know, do you? And it was interesting because I was driving to the airport the next day and I'm listening to the radio and he distilled it in the right way. He said, I just met with all these scientists from Scripps and everything. They can't tell us how much the sea is going to rise by the end of the century. It could be two feet, could be 10 feet, but it's happening. We have to be ready. Yeah. A, 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 and he distilled it to the right message. And then you go, and it's really hard. Uh, uh, John just gave one of the best statements that I've heard a local government person give because it's really hard for a lot of local government officials to grasp some of the issues he was just talking mm -hmm. about. And, yeah. and, you know, the California coast, some places it's really rocky and you can just do these pounding seas. And yet, you know, by Pacifica, oh, it's, it's sort of a, um, a whole different geological thing. And those cliffs have been falling and the apartments are falling into the ocean and, and the things are happening. Yeah, and so sure. how do you look at each one? And then the, when, the day we adopted the first sea level rise mm -hmm. science in 2011 at the Ocean Protection Council that morning, the tsunami hit from Japan. Mm. And there were two harbors in the entire state that yeah. really bit it. Uh -huh. And it was Crescent City and Santa Cruz. Uh -huh. And that was at low tide before sea level rise. Right. And so you can imagine what's going to happen. And I use this really outmoded example that everybody gets. It's not a bathtub slowly filling up. It's the two-year-old cannonballing into the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the extreme event. Yeah. That really makes the difference 
uh, uh, with sea level rise. And, and in addition right. to what John said, because it's roads, it's bridges, but it's also, um, we have all these municipal systems up and down the state, uh, gravity flow water systems that are attuned to the current level of the sea, force-fed sewage and sewage systems that are attuned to the current level of the sea. Mm -hmm. So how are we ready on all these? And in California, the Delta, where the Sacramento River and San Joaquin River uh, come together, is below sea level mm -hmm. uh, now. And, and that's the reason that when there's a substantial earthquake, if those levees fail, uh, water just flows in from the San Francisco Bay and it's salt water in an area of fresh water. And so it turns out that what is a hundred year event uh, for flooding in the Delta becomes a 10 year event wow. with one foot rise in, in sea level. Wow. And so there are all these things and it's really hard for people to grasp. It's really hard to get the intensity of the things that are going to happen. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our sea level, sea level rise policy, we're only envisioning it as a 20 year policy because we say that at you know, 15 years in, we're gonna have to check what the science is and yeah. we're making estimates about what we think is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we, it might be a lot worse, it might be a lot better, we just don't know. Um, and we think that's a better policy than having a policy that says it's only gonna be one way. Well, but it also brings up what you said about who pays for this? Yeah, where's this come from? And this is an issue that obviously the federal government is having a problem with, and especially when it comes to infrastructure. We all agree, Democrats and Republicans, and even this administration, agree that we need infrastructure investment. I guess it's what the three trillion that uh, we're behind on infrastructure investment, but we can't figure out how to pay for it. Nobody has the political will how to pay for it. Is it a gas tax? Do we do that again? Is it a vehicles miles traveled uh, sort of monitoring system? Is it build America bonds? Is it an investment infrastructure bank? I mean, nobody, we're talking about it, but once again, we're not, we're not seeing any leadership, unfortunately, when it comes to it. And fortunately, in the state, with SB1, um, you know, that's, that's something yeah. I think you guys are seeing the effects of it. We're Ooh. seeing the effects of it right now. And then we're also self-help counties. Here, the four counties in my district are all self-help counties mm -hmm. within the past two terms. Yeah, well, it makes a big difference. I mean, the, in 2017, we saw uh, a huge storms that's, here, that's right. that, that, that event that's that's only supposed to happen every 100 years. It was 40 years since the last big event. And uh, we got $130 million worth of damage with our local road system, half right. of all the damage in the state of California. That's right. uh, and, um, you know, we've had to fight the federal government, oh, right, yeah. to get our, oh, the money me. because, you trust know, me. we have a, a, a petty president who doesn't like California. And with the help of uh, leaders like you, um, we, would, we were able to, to, to work with the Federal Highway Administration to That's actually right. get the money that they said they were going to give us. But uh, there's a real problem at the federal level where the president uh, uh, believes that it's a, it's a historic shift in how we pay for it, right. where it's always been the, the Fed and the states come up with 80% and the local government comes up with 20%. And he wants to flip that. He says, we come up with the 80% yeah. yeah. and they only come up with 20%. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it it's, shouldn't, it's beyond shouldn't our be ability. this hard, but it is, but we'll get through it. Yeah. Good discussion, you guys. Uh, this is one of the, the, the best discussions I think I've seen just, you know, with, uh, with three electeds. Uh, and I was a little nervous because usually we do two, you know, or, or one or sometimes. And, and so that's plenty of, uh, of opportunity for people to talk. This is perfect, though. But, uh, you know, actually, believe it or not, we're running uh, close to the end of our hour. And if each of you could give uh, about a two or three minute uh, kind of what you would like our listeners to remember uh, about uh, the last time uh, before the election, probably. That uh, you were on, and um, and just give us something to think about, something to chew on, and and uh, something that uh, would be uh, beneficial for when, when our folks go to uh, the polls and, and they and they vote. But if we could start out with you, uh, uh, John, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you'd like people to remember uh, about tonight. Well, about I you. think you know when we're talking about these big policy changes, whether it be about climate change, uh, whether it be about housing, you really have to be willing to be engaged with the community and not just tell people what that you think should happen, but okay. really have engaged in dialogue yep. to help do some public education, mm -hmm. to bring lots of voices in, um, and to understand what the community needs, not right. just a small group needs. And, uh, and I've always tried to work uh, that we shouldn't just have 20 smart people figuring things out, we should have hundreds of people figuring these things out. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, you get a lot of buy-in from the community. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we face these big challenges, there are also great opportunities to, uh, to, to have the community come together, mm -hmm. to speak with one voice, um, and, and develop solutions that there's great buy-in mm -hmm. instead of great division. 
And so, you know, that's that's something that I try to do as an elected official yep. now and what I want to continue to do in the future. I've, and I've been to many of your meetings and I've seen that community buy in and it's extremely effective. Uh, you know, people feel like they, they own the process uh, and, you, and you brought it together in many of those instances. And that's amazing. I love to hear that you continue, want to continue that uh, to be reelected and to see that happen on an ongoing basis. That's 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 wonderful. We, we feel like as business people, we've been heard. Uh, when, when that happens, and, and as individual uh, folks that are just, you know, uh, mom and pop shops, and it, it just, the, you know, a gamut of people that are listening uh, to, and going to those meetings and having the input, it, there's, uh, there's buy-in for sure. Yeah, so thank I you for that. that. So, uh, uh, Jimmy, if you could uh, leave us with a few thoughts. Sure. I mean, it gets back to what was mentioned earlier, is that, you know, we do this job to affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. And in this position, I, I firmly believe, believe, and as I've seen in the past three years, uh, I've been able to affect people's lives for the better. Mm -hmm. And as I see this position, it really is a bridge from the central coast to the federal government and back. And we do that through a number of ways, dealing with personal federal issues that people have with the IRS, the VA, um, Social Security, and so forth, basically being able to be there for them, immigration mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. to help them deal with the federal bureaucracy. And you affect not only the individual, you affect their families, and you affect them staying here in this community. Mm -hmm. And so you affect their future. But it's also being able to fight for the values that we stand for on the Central Coast. I think you got a good taste of what the Central Coast is about with the three of us tonight. I'm fortunate enough that I was raised here and my sense of belonging drive my, drives my sense of service. I did not just move into this district to run for Congress. I've been here, I understand the district, I understand the policies and yes. the issues that are needed to be fought for in Washington, D.C., be it immigration, be it housing, be it the environment, be it our health care. I've done that in the past three years. I look forward to continuing to do that as we move forward. And it's, look, I think it's, it, it's been a challenge with this administration. We've been able to punch back when we needed to punch back. But at the same time, this is a job about relationship. You got to be able to work. You got to be able to have discussions to get things done. We've done it and we'll continue to do that as we go forward. Excellent. Thank you for the job you've done, by the way. Uh, uh, great stuff. I've followed uh, uh, a lot of the things uh, that you've done, uh, and certainly I'm not a pro, but as a layperson, uh, you've been successful and you've accomplished some great things. Um, and, and the buzz is that you're, you, we'd like to see you continue to do that. So, John Laird, if you can talk to us. You know, uh, John Leopold and I have this sort of amusing exchange because I told him once <laughs> that the best speech you will give is the night before the election because it will be battle tested with everybody you've talked to during the campaign and what it is. And, and we're nearing that point. And I've really sensed there's four things, plus a little on diversity and inclusion and immigration, on the minds of people. We've talked about two of them. It's climate and the fact that we have 10 years or yeah. we're gonna really be dead. And it's housing. Yeah. And the other two I'm hearing a lot about are health insurance and education and health insurance you know, in California, we added 5.4 million people mm -hmm. under the public option after Obamacare, mm -hmm. and we're fighting to keep them and trying to figure out how to get to some form of universal coverage in a way. And, and in education, we really have, uh, how is higher education affordable to everybody? It's the great equalizer. And how is our K through 12 system sustained? Mm -hmm. And so all those things are what's at play here. And and I'll be able to give a great speech the night before the election because it's been <laughs> battle tested and everybody has told me that's what matters to them in, in this district and, in, 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 you know, and, and I'm real excited because the reason I'm in this is to get things done. Sure. And there's a lot. And, and so, you know, it's been great uh, talking about this in a good way between all of us and, and I look forward to working together and I am not taking anything for granted. I've been working my mm. off uh, right. the last period of time. I mean, this is live, so we don't do bleeping. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I did a self bleep. Uh, uh, Thank you. you know, earlier this week, I did 14 events over two days in San Luis Obispo County. I'm determined that they feel like there's somebody that understands yeah. them and it's not any, with the possible exception of I go into rooms in San Luis Obispo County and somebody walks up and I'll say, I wondered where you went, and it'll be somebody from Santa Cruz that has moved to San Luis Obispo County, and I just didn't know, you know, and so there are more connections than I ever would have thought were true that way. Could you tell us a little bit how folks uh, might be able to get a hold of you if they wanted to now? 
um, it, to be able to talk, engage, and maybe ask questions? Uh, would it be an email? There's a phone? web page, uh, LairdForCASenate.com. There's an email address, info at LairdForCASenate.com. You email it, it'll get to me, and we'll figure something out. Okay. When I've done that in the past, I've been very responsive, by the way, so, so I appreciate that. Uh, so, so thank you. Thank you for all your service. And, uh, you know, for uh, for each of uh, of you gentlemen being here, and John, if you could ask, uh, if we could ask you, what, how can people get a hold of you? Um, it, you know, to to be able to just connect with you about questions and things. Well, there's lots of ways to get in contact with me. You know, I, I do have uh, I too have a website, friendsofjohnleopold.com. You can also go to the county website, which is santacruzcounty.us, and uh, my number's in the phone book, so uh, people okay. people call me. Okay, excellent. And local government should be close to the people they serve. Okay, good. I good. always advise them that if you're in local government and you go into the supermarket, get your frozen goods last because they will melt before <laughs> yeah. you can get through the checker. If my wife sends me out for a, uh, a, right. a, a, a thing of milk, she knows that it'll be an hour or two later. <laughs> come home. So if she really needs it, she'll get it herself. That's good. Jimmy? Uh, JimmyPanetta.com. Uh, and you can always go to Rep. Jimmy Panetta. As well, I mean, for the official side of things, if you need help with a federal issue, please contact our issue, our, our office. We will help you with those issues. Uh, if you're um, um, concerned with the campaign, please go and interested in the campaign. Please, uh, JimmyPanetta.com. And then, in terms of, uh, we do have another minute, maybe uh, we're close to it. But uh, in terms of being able to uh, connect with uh, with you folks, what what kind of issues might they contact? Let's say Jimmy's office, as opposed to John Leopold's, uh, and your, yours as well. Uh, we got a minute left, so this will be quick. Like I said, federal, issue, federal issues, immigration, veterans affairs, social security, IRS, okay. uh, those types of issues. We are your bridge to the federal bureaucracy and back. We will help you. And Excellent. at the state, it would be the Department of Fish and Wildlife if you're having trouble with an educational institution, okay. uh, having trouble with the franchise tax board, those kinds of things. Excellent. And for me, it's basically everything else. Local <laughs> land use, police, fire, uh, Would you pick uh, parks, up some milk uh, for me, too? Yeah. <laughs> he left off barking dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, in, in an unincorporated area like I represent, you're, you're everything from the dog catcher to the planning director to the, uh, to the one providing health services. Excellent. So. Thank you, gentlemen. This was a, a great show. Uh, I am looking forward to each of you serving uh, in our community, both at the, at the national, at the state level, and the county. So thank you so much for being here this evening. Thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good.